Um, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, we are here today for the panel on big challenges in um, uh, low middle income countries and the big challenges that technological researchers are faced with in uh, low middle income countries. Uh, I am Alma Yesic. I'm one of the founding members of uh, ABRIR, the consortium of researchers from uh, developing countries. And I'm here today with my dear colleagues, Sabina Chehaj Klensky from Stockholm University and uh, Dana Basne Brown uh, from uh, International American University in Kenya. Is this right? Uh, so uh, I would, um, I'm very happy to be here that we will be discussing this very important topic on challenges that all of us uh, have been faced with while working in uh, low middle income countries as psychological researchers or as students or as teachers and professors of psychology. Uh, and uh, what type of challenges that we were facing and what type of challenges actually we are um, uh, we, we think that we can overcome and what are the ways to overcome these challenges. Each one of us has the experience of working in both uh, developing countries and developed countries, if you can say that. So we both worked in both global south and global north. So uh, I think that we can have a fruitful discussion today and that we will also get uh, many of your questions uh, du during our live question and answer session that will be held on September 22nd. So before we start with our discussion, uh, I would like my colleagues to introduce themselves to you and to tell something more about where they are based now, what they are working on, and uh, like what do they think actually about uh, big data science in general. So whoever wants to start. Shall I start? Yeah. Um, so yes, I'm Sabina Chahait Clancy, a social psychologist. I'm currently affiliated uh, with Stockholm University in Sweden which is um, by far um, not a low income or uh, a developing uh, country. But myself, um, I, I come from the so-called global south um, and the low income uh, country where I have uh, worked for many years, both as a student initially uh, and later on as researcher and professor, teacher, um, uh, trying uh, to understand um, intergroup relations in post-conflict uh, societies. Uh, I have recently uh, moved, and we can also discuss this, uh, why did I leave uh, a context that uh, did not provide enough, uh, or if at all, any support uh, for the kind of work that um, I and my colleagues have been working on, and why I'm now uh, basically based and affiliated um, here in Sweden. So I've been pendling back and forth between developed and developing countries. Um, so I can, I will try um, and attempt to kind of offer my um, insights and experiences on what the challenges or that, uh, that researchers in general and social psychologists um, in particular um, are faced with and how uh, have I personally attempted to overcome those um, and how we can, in generally speaking, overcome um, those uh, particular challenges. Yeah, thank you very much, Dana. Yeah, good morning, um, or as, as good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'm Dana Basnate Brown, and for the past 10 years, um, I've been based in Nairobi, Kenya. So I am originally from the US and did a lot of my training there and was presented with an opportunity to move to Kenya very unexpectedly. I wasn't looking for this um, some years ago. And so I currently have served there as the associate um, associate professor at United States International University, Africa, and also as the director of the Center for Cognitive and Developmental Research. Um, I'm also currently an associate director at the Psychological Science Accelerator, uh, which some of you may um, be familiar with, the PSA, which is a global laboratory network with members from dozens of countries um, across six continents. So a lot of my research focuses on multilingualism um, and how, particularly how multilingual communities and individuals use their languages. Uh, often I do a lot of my research within the domain of emotion. And more recently I have a growing interest because of spending the last decade in East Africa in international research development and in big team science initiatives. Um, 
I think I've particularly become more interested in big team science, seeing the many advantages that it brings to the table. Uh, there's a quote I often like to share in a lot of presentations I give that says, you know, the lone researcher is now a less viable model for major innovation. And I just think that couldn't be more true. Um, I think that, you know, I've heard some researchers say that how we do science now is going to change more in the next 20 years than it has in the last 300 years. And I think that only time will tell if that really happens, but I think we really are witnessing an exciting time in terms of the globalization of research. And I think that we really can only answer some of the biggest questions uh, surrounding psychological science and science in general when we do have big team initiatives where we have experts in you know diverse areas. So that is um, one of the reasons I think working in like collaborative international teams is only going to increase um, in the years to come. And one of one of the reasons that I think this webinar and what some of the large team science networks are doing uh, is really exciting. Thank you very much. So as I said, like I'm Alma Yevtic, one of the founding members of Abri. I'm also a psychological scientist, currently affiliated with the Pitts Research Institute at the International Christian University in Tokyo. I am educated in both Bosnia and Serbia, which are like a global south, but I was also educated partially in Italy and Austria, which are like global north. And I can easily tell like the difference, starting with uh, the point that uh, in global south, I actually had to struggle to find the textbooks and to find like uh, access uh, to journal articles that are relevant to my work. While immediately when I like transfer to Austria, when I transfer to Italy, actually I never suffer from uh, anything like that. Also, currently in Japan, I have access to all possible databases. Uh, I have access also to labs. And also, like, uh, I'm surrounded by people who are ready to invest in science. So I would say that those are like two, let's say, two of my biggest challenges that I faced, like, both like a student, both BA level, MA and PhD student, and then later on as a uh, someone who was also teaching psychology and also uh, working as a researcher. Uh, in terms of like what was Dana saying previously, uh, challenges in big team science in low middle income countries, I can say that I'm a member of a psychological science accelerator since like somewhere end of the long beginning of this year. So basically I've been there for a very short period of time, uh, but I'm very much uh, impressed by what they've done so far. And I'm uh, really impressed by a number of labs that actually joined the Psychological Science Accelerator. Uh, but uh, I also always like to emphasize that to me, uh, big team science is like an open science, it's something more than just open methodology, data, access, peer review, open education, open collaboration. It is something in line with what uh, those of you who read Flavio Azevedo's um, uh, latest interview for, with uh, NASA Journal, he said that uh, open science is actually something related to social justice. Mm -hmm. And that is actually why I started with this, so like access to journals, access to textbooks, access to materials, access to lectures. Uh, so that's why we also uh, decided to upload all of these videos and all of these materials that actually that we are going to receive to YouTube. Everything will be available and translated to several languages uh, because uh, we strongly believe that everyone should have, have equal access to science and, and material that they need in order to study, in order to perform research. Everyone should have access to certain funding. But I think that in such a case, it's like uh, also interesting that usually I was able to get funding which was outside of my country, but I was never able to actually find funding in my country and funding that would come from like government or other agencies that were somehow connected to my work. So maybe that is also something that we can uh, discuss, like uh, what kind of challenges you present in low middle income countries and to the researchers who are working there. So um, we'll like just briefly touch these big challenges of uh, big team science and low to middle income countries. But um, when talking about these major barriers, um, what do you think, like, what were your, in your opinion, like your biggest barriers uh, that you were faced with while you were trying to do uh, open science and big team science in uh, your country, which was like low to middle income country, or at the moment, like, you know, the Dana is currently based in one. So what are your challenges compared to basically like uh, 
uh, what you could have done in uh, the US or anywhere else in the uh, world of work. Sabina can also join the point. Great. Yeah. These examples from Bosnia and. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can briefly, uh, if I may, um, yeah, sure. just briefly. Um, I mean, second, what what both of you have mentioned, um, and um, and relate to 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 those challenges um, personally in my in my almost uh, um, two decade long career now. Um, um, but my first one that I would add, the first one when I now think back, you know, twenty years ago when I started um, coming um, from Bosnia, from a war torn country. So not just was it a country that is in the Global South, that is a low uh, low income country, uh, you know, um, country that is uh, on its path towards development, uh, but it was also torn by war and conflict, and so that is the context that that basically um, I started um, uh, my studies, you know, and I started to to think or or to flirt with 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 this concept and idea of doing scientific research. And the first, um, the first um, challenge that, that I have encountered um, was language, because um, um, everything that I uh, I have I have read and it and those were also the access to 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 the articles was was minimal. The access to to literature was minimal at that time. So it was almost it was almost like a piece of gold, you know, if you if you can find, you know, the original paper or the original study that you know claims this or that, you know. So that alone took effort and time and resources. And very often I was not successful in finding um, and having access. Again, I'm talking about 20 years ago now, having access um, to, to to literature, to sources. Then the second one, once I once I get my hands on it, the second one was language, of course, you know, and 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 I think this is something that we don't talk enough about, you know, but most of the science and most of the research is done in English language. And when we're talking about inclusivity and diversity, um, um, uh, most of us are not English native speakers and 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 yet we are expected to to not only do science, but eventually to publish and write in the English language. I think personally that is one of the really big, big challenges for researchers all over the world um, who are not English natives. Um, so that was the one one particular obstacle that I had, like probably most of us, I'm just not speaking here for myself, had to overcome and work on in addition to developing as a researcher as well. So so that was that was that was kind of the first initial 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 kind of uh, block to, to to be faced with and then comes everything else that you that you also mentioned the the the, the basically I felt you know once I left Boston and I came back um, and did most of my research um, um, uh, by living uh, living in in that country um, I it was an extremely lonely and unfunded business. So that's pretty much what what my experience uh, has been um, for 15 years in Bosnia. So very, very, very lonely, um, not surrounded by uh, uh, by anybody um, who would even be concerned about you know topics that, that that I was concerned with. So who I could you know discuss this with, and then literally zero funding for to to support this kind of uh, process and this kind of initiatives. Um, the advantages of that, <laughs> of having been lonely in that environment, was that I was forced to form an international network. And and I now I can say and that makes me and that that is the cause of all the success that I have had is basically the network that I have established throughout the world. And maybe I wouldn't have established such an impressive international network had I not been lonely. You know, so what I'm trying to say here is I'm trying to see an opportunity in a crisis kind of thing. And. And um, what what I have um, attempted to do, and what what came out as, as as an outcome. Anyway, I just threw threw at you a few few of the few thoughts and few challenges that I personally have been faced with, but um, we can go back and pick up on those um, later on as we go on. So, Dana, over to you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I can actually attest to the the loneliness factor that I wasn't even thinking of that as one of them, but. That was very much my experience as well. Um, when I was first getting my lab set up in East Africa, people kept telling me um, I was the only cognitive psychologist 
in East Africa. Then I was being told that this was the only lab, you know, studying human cognition in the area. Uh, things I wasn't even necessarily aware of when I went there, but it did create like a very lonely environment. There was no mm -hmm. one in the area doing similar research. Um, people trying to understand when I would first requested like lab space at my university, I was told, you know, can you just collect um, data in your office? And we don't even have our own office space. So I'm sharing my office with other faculty. So how would that you know, really be conducive to um, maybe collecting data or a lab environment. So there just were a lot of variables at play um, that made it very difficult to like get a research program going. Um, a couple big ones that came into my mind when thinking about this, which I sort of classify under the theme of like resource uh, driven, the, the heavier, more obvious ones we tend to think of. Um, but in my experience, it's been like IRB processes those can be really different in different countries, the information they want, the formatting of it um, in at our university. And this could actually be viewed as an advantage for open science initiatives, but you almost, it's almost like you're submitting like a, you know, registered report because you need to have your full literature review done and all this kind of additional information that I wasn't always asked for at the IRB stage um, in some Western countries. So IRBs are very different. In a lot of African countries, IRBs don't even exist. Uh, Kenya is one of the rare ones that now does require this, but it's very, very new. So I was actually on like the founding board at my institution of creating the IRB and I served as vice chair for a while. And so sort of got to see from the beginning how do you even create something like that when it is a, a sort of new model at the university? Um, the advantage is it was really exciting and interesting to see how that was done because coming from the U.S., it was more well established there at many universities. Uh, but challenges are that like the research, the research offices are not as well staffed. There's just a few individuals working there. So IRBs can be lengthy. They can be also very costly. I've talked to colleagues at a lot of other Afri in a lot of other African countries where IRBs are also really expensive there, just like they are in Kenya. And that's for local um, researchers at institutions there, as well as even more expensive if it, will, if it was a international person who just wanted to travel there briefly to collect data, that person would pay even more. So I are, that's a big, I think, hurdle that a lot of people will face that funding is certainly non-existent or lower, and then you have costs and more lengthy IRB and um, just ethics approvals. So that was a big one that came into my mind and that we've also faced with the PSA of trying to get ethics approvals from many different institutions and in many different locations um, to run projects. It's not always allowed in different countries that you can just use the IRB from, you know, the US or, or you know, mm -hmm. France or somewhere else. Um, not every country allows that. So that's another consideration. Uh, but I think a second one, um, as Sabina mentioned, is funding. Uh, in Africa, you know, research is really still just marginally funded. If there are opportunities, they tend to be actually outside uh, the country because the local government doesn't fund a high percentage um, of their GDP towards, you know, research and development just two years ago, people had said that Africa's R&D was around like 0.42% um, put towards, you know, research funding, 0.42% um, of GDP towards R&D versus 1.7%, I think is like the global average just for reference. So that sort of gives you an idea of the constraints in terms of getting funding at like a national level. And then even at the institutional level, um, it can be very difficult. Uh, even attending conferences can be very difficult. So that's another challenge. Um, and a lot of the funding too speaks to, you know, psychological science is not really a well-known term. So one encouragement I often have for some people is like thinking about how to frame certain psychology studies in terms of how can they be more relatable to fields like economics or public health or education because sometimes there's more funding available in some of those domains that have like a longer history in the country in terms of research. And so being strategic in terms of thinking about how to make those, 
you know, a research topic you're exploring relatable to maybe one of those disciplines where funding might be more readily available, but still that's a very, very big challenge. Um, and then the last one, which I alluded to, which I would consider like infrastructure and just material resources, um, as was already mentioned here, you know, access to textbooks and getting access to journal articles, open science initiatives have helped a lot with that. There's platforms now where that are just specifically for African journals where they're open, open access. And that has helped a lot. That's where my students can often find materials. Uh, but that's still a big challenge. When I arrived in Kenya, I brought a lot of textbooks with me. It was very hard to get any kind of new ones at the time. And so just, yeah, the reading material, um, having it be culturally relevant is always a limitation. And I think um, just as I mentioned, the lab space, the actual space at the universities, a lot of the universities are overcrowded, people fighting for resources. And so even having some kind of, some people might be doing field research and maybe you don't need a lab, but if you're doing certain types of basic research and you need lab facilities, that's a really big limitation. There's just not the space, not the funding. Um, and so you're constantly, you know, competing for resources and those kinds of things. Yeah, thank you very much. I think, I mean, like, I can reflect a lot on all of what you said, considering, like, it's somebody who probably reminded me of my time as a student in Bosnia, actually. Uh, what I can say also is that, like, um, and what also Sabina said, it was like, uh, when you find an article, it was like you found something that is like that has a value of gold because it was so hard to find it. And later on, I actually understand that uh, in most of the cases, I could have emailed to author and they would have sent it to me. But at that time, like there was no one to give me actually that type of advice. So uh, at some points, it was also that uh, I didn't have access to resources, but I also didn't have like the right guidance of mm -hmm. how to find those resources and how to search for those resources. Later on, I understood that people and professors outside are much more approachable than I was thinking they would be. So uh, I somehow found ways to uh, find my articles, to find like even some book chapters, parts of the book that I needed and so on. And even to get some advice on how to maybe structure my research paper and so on. So that's why I strongly believe in those initiatives such as the PSA and also FORT, which is a framework for open and reproducible research training that also has this component of pedagogy where they are actually talking about how to teach open science, how to teach psychological science. Because when we are talking about like justice, equality, inclusion, we also have to take in mind that psychology is being taught in totally different ways in different areas, not only global south and global north, but also within those countries. So there are differences. When I moved to Austria, I understood that they consider psychology uh, like a natural science. So basically they were mostly into neuroscience and mostly investing in neuroscience. What I was doing was also was part of some like uh, psychology, but social psychology, but also they preferred it to be more like experimental social psychology or experimental, like, uh, like, like everything had to be like somehow experimental, if not like pure neuroscience. So to me, it was also like something totally new experience, like to see that basically what I was doing, like integral relations, something like that was to them something that was like, okay, you are doing that now, but to us now, that is something new because we don't really like have students who are doing something like that. And then they asked me to give a presentation to their PhD students so that they can hear something like different in psychology. So those are just some examples of how we differ, like also among not only continents, but also like countries that are like pretty close to each other in terms of how we teach psychology. So now we actually explore deeply, like all of these both individual and like, let's say problems that we faced with and barriers and um, what do you think uh, in your opinion what would you like to suggest as some sort of like let's say we cannot really say like uh, ways to overcome those problems because there is we cannot really come up with some sort of recipes here during this panel but what do you think can actually help contemporary generations of psychology students in low to middle income countries to somehow join big teams to join big team science to join like let's say a PSA and some PSA projects or or whichever projects uh project has been done currently in psychology in terms like of like open science and big team science. What do you think what can help them somehow to connect them to those centers and how they can actually approach uh, centers of people? Is there some sort of like a 
like way for them to basically like um, search for resources and not just resources but also relevant advice and opportunity to work on something. I can add, oh, yeah, go ahead, Donna, go oh, ahead. One, one I would mention is probably um, training. So I think just as you just mentioned, lack of training or limited training is sometimes like the number one challenge a lot of my students will tell me uh, makes it difficult for them to sort of join collaborations um, or to know where to begin. They have, I always give students that advice of emailing authors to try to get, you know, papers and once again, they haven't they haven't heard that before. They maybe didn't know that that was okay or how to go about doing that. And so a lot of, I teach a course actually that I designed some years ago on like how to give a conference presentation, how to create a poster, just things like that, that they haven't come across in their undergraduate training and things like that if, if they're uh, at the graduate level. And so that's been really fun to teach, but I think it's something that they feel I know is a big limitation. So if some of these collaborations or these big team science initiatives like offered training on open science practices or maybe it's elements of you know data analysis or how to use R or different things like that. And there are a lot of resources out there now compared to years ago. So that's changed a lot. I think the pandemic has actually allowed that to continue to grow, which is I think a good thing um, for people in locations where getting access to those resources has historically been more difficult. So, but training is definitely, I would say like the number one thing that students will come to me and say, oh, I never heard about X, Y, and Z until I took your, your research methods course or until I took this course on how to publish a paper. I didn't necessarily know how to go about doing that. So that is one thing. Um, another thing that's more systemic, there's not really an easy solution to this, but um, graduate students, at least in Kenya, they tend to be, because of the funding issue, they tend to be working full-time um, in outside areas of employment. And, you know, they're getting their PhD um, at night on the side, doing their work where they can. So time constraints are just a very big reality of the situation because they are not going to graduate school as full-time. That is a secondary thing. They have to have their regular job to make income pay their school fees and so forth. So once again, like I said, that's more systemic, but I guess it does come back to the situation of if there were individuals who did have funding available, that could mean individuals could join these, you know, big team science initiatives because they might not have to work their day job, so to speak. Um, but the, the time constraints on the graduate students, and I know it's the same in many parts of the world, but there are locations, of course, in US and EU where students are able to focus more specifically on their studies because they're funded by the university. So that is another um, limitation. And I think a solution would be having, um, having some kind of funding available to help those individuals. So. But yeah, training is a training is a big one. So I just put that out there as yeah. uh, no, I I I I I could not agree more with that. If I can just add, um, I don't know, Alma, if, if I can just jump in. Yeah, of course. Um, and um, just add um, uh, two more. I mean, who who am I to to give advices? But you know, based on based on based on the experience um, uh, that I've had and direct and also indirect through meeting meeting people. Um, who are struggling, right, to, to kind of um, stay competitive uh, enough in this market. Um, two things that, that I would um, add to this and recommend would um, be overcoming this, this feeling of being intimidated. I have met um, a lot of um, brilliant thinkers. In my case, they happened to be from Eastern Europe, um, so not necessarily um, um, the, 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 the global south in that sense, but still from countries that are not um, or cannot be um, compared um, uh, uh, to, to, the, to the, the sort of uh, the weird and the most more developed countries where actually science is uh, produced, right? Uh, where is the source of scientific knowledge as we speak? 
Um, and uh, so in my case, those were the scholars and researchers and just students, right? That happened to be from Eastern Europe. And um, they were some of the most brilliant people that I have ever met. And yet at the same time, I have encountered their lack of confidence. Um, that they can actually bring something to the table. While I'm meeting these brilliant thinkers who are actually not so sure that they have something to contribute, at the same time, this is now through my time because I did live in the United Kingdom uh, where I got my doctorate. I also did my postdoctoral research at Stanford University in the US. So I've also experienced the other part of the world. Um, while at the same time meeting um, people there who, if anything, had an overconfidence that they are actually, that they have something to bring to the table and not necessarily, they were not necessarily more brilliant in, in, their, in their ideas and thinking. And I always puzzled me, you know, I was always a little, not annoyed, but sort of like I wished and I hoped that, that, that researchers um, from the shadow, right, or from these, you know, countries that are not at the forefront, that are not driving this process forward, that they would simply just believe that they can do this, or they believe that they actually have something to say. And of course, couple that with training that, that Dana mentioned as a, as, a, as a required condition, then it will produce or it can produce um, some desired outcomes. But I think that's also important to keep in mind, and it would be really my advice that not uh, not to feel intimidated in in that in that process just because we are not part of that game yet. Um, so that would be the first one, and the second one um, is also something I always tell to my students. Of course, this is very individual, but also societal, depending on where one is in one's own life, but also where one is in one's um, context. Um, uh, if one can, right, um, try to really get mobile. So before this idea of joining teams, I think it's very, very important to get out of there and wherever one is. And even if one is in Sweden, like I am now, so even I'm telling, now I'm working in Sweden, I've been here for now almost three years. It is a developed country that really gives a lot of money um, uh, to research. That's one of the reasons why I actually moved to this place because I have now access to funding, right? Um, that actually now for the first time, my research is being funded, right? Um, now I'm actually wondering how did on earth did that produce anything you know, <laughs> up until this point, you know, which is, which, is an, which is another interesting story. I'm now wondering how did you Sabina do anything, you know, without, uh, without any money? But th that story aside, even when you live and work in a country like I am now in Sweden, I even tell the students from Sweden, get out of here. You see, so so even when you are at the source of everything, I strongly believe that one has to um, experience mobility and move before one is then capable of effectively joining the team, right? Of saying, okay, now I am here, stuck or by choice, whichever, and I am now then joining this team and offering A, B, and C to the table, right? Um, so I think this mobility. Um, and this overcoming um, lack of confidence, or, or however we want to call it, uh, for now, uh, is also something that I would um, add as 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 advices um, uh, to overcoming these challenges um, and add to what Dana already mentioned. Yeah, I'm really happy that Sabina just uh, mentioned all of these very important things because it is actually like the beginning uh, of uh, what I wanted to. Uh, ask you uh, like now when we are like almost close to the end of this panel um, how to increase like representation of researchers like local researchers from low to middle income countries in these uh, big team science projects in general and in open science I mean uh, I can see from my point of view because I mean as I said previously I was like in both global south and then global north now I'm in Japan next year I will be at the University of Copenhagen so uh, basically I can tell the difference, but I can also tell that um, somehow during these pandemics, when most of the universities switched to online events, I actually got the opportunity to meet more people, to join more teams and to collaborate with much more people than uh, before. So somehow I realized that um, although at the time was like the worst time they were you know, experienced, like being closed, being like unable to travel and to go anywhere, 
uh, but somehow I found that as an opportunity mm. to develop myself further and to basically like find a way to learn something new from those people from these teams. Uh, so I think that um, maybe what can somehow help us increase the representation is also to in future keep some sort of a hybrid form at least. So that those who do not have opportunity to travel, especially those from, for instance, students from Africa, it's really hard for them to travel to the, for instance, US and uh, Europe in general. And also sometimes even for uh, students from Eastern Europe, it's hard to travel like to Europe, to, 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 to Western Europe, to Australia or New Zealand or other big centers. So I would always like, suggest to basically somehow keep some sort of a hybrid events or some sort of like, uh, I don't know, more online visible and accessible information mm -hmm. that they can reach and that they can reach out to and that they can basically share and learn from. So I think that that's somehow, although I'm in Japan now, like, and I can have access to money to travel and so on, it is, you cannot always travel everywhere. You cannot be everywhere and you can never have that large funding to go like to three or five places in one year. So uh, it's like somehow always better to have that option basically to at least find something online and or to join all online to tune in and see what people have to say, what want to say and what people, how, how they can actually uh, help you improve yourself. Um, what else I would like, um, it's also important like uh, to have some sort of clear procedures of how to join. For instance, like I, I'm mentioning PSA because somehow PSA helped us a lot uh, with Abrir. Also, Ford helps us helped us a lot with Abner. So it's just like somehow uh, when you join the Slack channel, you have that like a uh, sub channel general or announcement, and then you can just like write a brief message, brief introduction, and ask. I, I just ask like, is this the right place to ask this and that? Is this the right place to join this project? Is this that? and people will come and. And, and respond to you. So I think that those clear procedures or how to join certain group, how to join certain events are also very important because uh, as Sabina said, sometimes people have that like um, that impression that like, they are not good enough to join or they're not good enough to uh, speak up where they are not good enough to basically present themselves and present their work. But when you have these like clear like guidelines written somewhere then you can sometimes say okay i will do this if it's a, they say like write your message here i will write my message there and then i will see if someone will get back to me once when you receive response you know you feel more confident to ask more and to join and work and collaborate further so i think that is also something that from my experience also helped me to get rid of some of my like fears and anxieties in terms of how to join and how to collaborate uh more so um I don't know, but uh, now I will give floor to you to say, like, what do you think what else can be done in order to increase the representation? Because we still lack representation of uh, uh, researchers from uh, low to middle income countries and global uh, south in general. I mean, I have nothing more to add other than um, that we individually and, and institutionally as well, collectively, that we should just continue with these initiatives. I think I'm seeing now much more initiatives than ever before, right? Um, and I think it's just important. So now it's the best time that we have ever had so, up until now, you see? So, so from now on, it can only get better if we um, continue uh, strategically with um, these initiatives, as I said, individual and, 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 and institutional and collective level uh, that promote, um, not just promote, but that basically enable, one thing is to promote ideas, but another initiatives are to really uh, systematically enable uh, more inclusion and more diversity. Um, 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 in this context, we're talking about research, um, research and science. So, 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 so basically, um, not losing the momentum, right? Um, and 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 seeing this as a long-lasting process. So, so this is not something that we will, we will, we we have an issue and we will deal with this in the next decade and then we're done. You know. So this is something that we have to see as as 
as a long lasting uh, marathon, you know, rather than a quick sprint, uh, you know, that will basically be ch uh, addressing and challenge um, in and dealing with these with these um, questions that we are discussing right now here together. So I have nothing more in particular to add at, at, uh, at this point, other than um, other than this, maybe Dana has something uh, more to say. Yeah, thank you for that. I um would just like to sort of expand on, I think your point earlier was so excellent in terms of encouraging even your students in you know, Sweden to get out. And I think that's one of the biggest, you know, because people might perceive it as, well, this is a really well-funded country. Why would you go and look at how research is done in other locations? Um, and since I sort of came from that perspective of like, you know, doing my training in the U.S. and running a research program there and then going to a, you know, LMIC um, in East Africa, I sort of got to see the shift in sort of that reverse direction of what a lot of people experience. And it's so rewarding because it's opened my eyes to see how do researchers do things when they are less resourced? How do we how do I have to be really creative in getting my lab set up and figuring out um, compensation for participants and just all sorts of things that were done compl in completely different ways than I was used to doing them in the U.S. And I think that by joining these organizations, coming back to your point of, you know, joining PSA or many babies or many of the 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 many many's that are out there as we say um and a lot of those organizations are working together which is really nice too they're not competing with each other they're doing different things and they're working with each other to see what can we learn from the other one and so when you get those slack channels or just people joining they can learn a tremendous amount from the individuals who are working in the underrepresented areas um because I mean, that's really what has spurred my whole interest in international research development and forming a framework of everything is not done the way that it's done in the U.S., nor should it be. Um, but you can sometimes think this is how IRBs have to work. This is how um, labs have to work because that's what you've seen. And both can can learn from each other. But I think that's one of the the biggest things of joining those networks and getting to hear from individuals in different locations with different perspectives. There's cultural norms that can drive, you know, differences in consent processes in research. I mean, a lot of different logistics like that, which I could go on and on about, um, but we don't have time for, but just those are some of the big advantages. Um, Another really big one I did just want to mention, I have actually a couple quotes that I can share if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Um, so let me just share this. So this comes from um, a student of mine and I just wanted to, you to hear it in their words, but I think having research questions that are relatable and relevant to the local culture is probably one of the biggest things that we can do to make things more inclusive. So this student says, what I think can be done to make psychological science more inclusive of African psychology behaviors and thoughts is to generate awareness about how psychological science and scientific method in general can be used to solve real problems that affect African communities. I personally think that one big barrier for a lot of individuals may be joining some initiatives in addition to the other factors we mentioned is that the research questions they're seeing done um, by some of maybe these international collaborators just aren't really relevant for their community. Uh, and so I liked this quote and there's another one here um, up top, there's a student who says, we always complain that reading materials don't give relevant examples from an African context. And so we need to start creating materials and research plays a big role in this. So really wanting to see their research questions and the things that are relevant to their local context portrayed in whether it's an international textbook or whether it is uh, the topics that others are tackling. And I have down on the bottom here, um, just very recently this year, um, Ade Adetula sort of spearheaded um, an article that came out talking about how psychology should generalize from not just to Africa. So this same idea that many of the replications that are done 
on the African continent are usually, you know, imported there from Western countries, but what about looking at some of the scientific findings that have been generated in Africa and how well do those generalize outside of Africa? And that's something that I think is a really exciting to think about the bi-directionality that we can have with our scientific research questions, which I think for far too long, we've only had things going in one direction. Um, but I also think that that's changing a lot. And that's another thing that is really exciting. And so comes back to, I think, Sabina's point earlier too, about people being interested in mobility and not just staying, you know, in the context that they're in and not being, you know, willing to, or just being focused on staying in a very well-resourced area and moving from place to place in that regard. Um, I remember years ago when I was making the decision to move to Africa, I had been offered a a position in the U.S. and decided to do something very non-traditional, at least what my advisors were used to in moving to Africa. And I actually had a mentor um, who was probably trying to give good advice, but told me that I was committing professional suicide by moving, taking this position um, in Africa and doing something so radical. And I'm a risk taker, so I didn't really care. Um, but that's just interesting to think of that could be the perspective of this is a more, much more senior researcher uh, from a very prestigious university who had given me that advice. And once again, I know it was probably had good intentions, but that does sort of highlight, I think, the mentality that some people may have if you're you know, going from a high resource area to a lower resource area, because it does make things more difficult, but there are so many rewards uh, that come from that. And I've seen colleagues in this area have a much higher level of creativity and how they approach things because they are working with more scarce resources. So they're very creative in how they approach things, which I'm constantly impressed by. And so there's just a lot to be learned from both sides, you know, global north, global south, or however you want to define it. So that was just one thing that comes to mind of having research questions that are relevant uh, for the context is what is probably going to help people, whether they're in the Middle East or wherever they are, become actually interested in maybe joining an initiative. And one other just small thing I'll mention is coming back to IRB too, that's actually something that can determine whether IRBs are approved at certain institutions. So in Kenya, and I've seen this even at my own institution, one of their um, exact quotes from their research handbook is that the research must be guided by humanitarian and equity-based concerns, not by the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake. And that is a determiner in something getting IRB approval. So that is showing us like they want to see that there's community benefit from whatever the research project is, um, not just that it's for knowledge gain, which is often also a little bit of a different approach than maybe some institutions might have in other parts of the world. So just mentioning um, that was one sort of main hurdle that came to mind that could be difficult for some people. And I'll stop sharing this now to but. I'm really glad that you mentioned Adia Zetuma. He will be actually leading one of the hackathons during our Congress too, uh, and talking about the generalization of results from uh, the Global South, actually. Uh, so I think that he, yeah, he contributed a lot to that area, and I'm really happy that we will have him here uh, to, talk to, the, to speak to the wider awake audience during the conference. Uh, so since we are now approaching like, the end, uh, do we have any final thoughts or I don't know, insights, recommendations or anything that you would like to share? Um, no, other than maybe, and maybe we can leave this, as far as I understand, we will have a live Q&A. Yes. Correct? Um, and I think maybe it would be good to mention um, the time um, um, uh, that will be September 22nd. Time is 7.30 p.m. Central European. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, and uh, whoever checked the program, we also converted the time to different time zones. So it's written exactly what time it's going to be in Africa, what time it's going to be in the U.S., and so on, different time zones. 
But I guess what what maybe we can also leave it for this uh, Q and A or for now. What, 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 what another point that that um that I just came to my mind as as Dana was speaking, um and she mentioned it um as well was uh we are, we are talking the whole time about challenges and obstacles, right? But maybe we can also highlight um, some advantages and opportunities um, um and benefits from being and living those challenges and living among those obstacles. And Dana mentioned, you know, high level of creativity, right? That that almost um, is it comes out <laughs> um, as a necessity, as a, as a required kind of um, uh, condition for to produce anything to begin with under these conditions and circumstances. Um, I myself have also encountered um, a lot of, um, uh, advantages having worked in in such um, uh, research disabling uh, conditions. Um, uh, in addition to creativity that was mentioned, um, I also encountered extremely high degree of motivation. So only people who are highly motivated were the ones who ended up <laughs> doing these kinds of research under these circumstances. Otherwise, because they did not have much other incentive, right? <laughs> To, to, to do this. So, so the people who do work and who do operate in, in, in very research dire conditions, you know, the global south or, or you know, or as we are naming it um, for, these, for this particular discussion, um, in my opinion, are at the same time very motivated and maybe even more motivated than maybe, maybe on average now, you know, uh, researchers that are basically um, um, granted much more, right, <laughs> um, in that sense than maybe researchers in other parts of the world. So I think what, what I'm trying to say here is that that they, um, this is not to say that we should not change the circumstances, and this is not to say that we should not promote inclusivity and diversity, but this is just to say that while we are on the path of changing, um, changing things that that may be focusing on some of the advantages and benefits that these current situations bring uh, with them uh, might be also useful um, or at least functional strategy to dealing with uh, uh, with these challenges at the same time. Yeah, that is also like uh, something that we can usefully put at the end of this panel actually that uh, also uh, living in uh, Global South can have uh, its own challenges, but it can also have its own uh, advantages. Actually, what helped me, like as Sabina also mentioned at the very beginning, Bosnia is also post part of post war country, uh, and also uh, it's a developing country. It is very um, uh, they, they don't really invest that much into science, especially not into psychological science, but you can still find students and people who are trying to do something and who are motivated to do something are like out of nothing like even though they struggle they don't have anything they're still like trying to contribute uh i also have a like really good experience with that motivation while i was uh, studying uh, for my phd in belgrade where i met professors who actually were also trying to do something even though their resources were pretty limited so th there are some of these. So then you start asking yourself, like, uh, if they get the real funding, if they get into the real like uh, labs and real like universities that invest in uh, science, what exactly they are going to produce then? Uh, so like, I mean, th those are these like the things that also motivate you even more. And once when you find yourself somewhere where you can actually, uh, you can do science without thinking of whether you will be capable of uh, arranging everything or not. Uh, you realize that actually, you know, like uh, you still have that same motivation and you will never basically, at least from my point of view, I will never forget the time I spent there and all these struggles that I had. And somehow that is also motivating me to this Avril and all of the, whatever we actually plan for Avril in the future. Uh, and that is also my general motivation that everyone should be able to study psychology and to learn psychology. And that is something that uh, basically is guiding me to all of this. Uh, but I don't think that I would have had all these opinions uh, if I wasn't raised and educated in developing country. So I think that that was also some something that I found as an advantage that somehow motivates me to go further. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's I I just yeah would add to that coming back to just the the creativity and the greater level of resourcefulness because you've had to work with limited resources. Um, that's one of, I think, the 
greatest rewards and gifts that that I've learned and I see in other colleagues by working in the location that I'm in. Um, and the other one I would probably add too is I've experienced a greater openness to open science practices. Um, I know that's changed a lot around the world in general, but when even when I first came to Kenya, I found that there was much, people were embracing um, open access publishing and things like that, much more so than I had experienced, at least where I was coming from in the U.S., um, and I think it's just out of necessity, you know, universities don't have large sums of money to, you know, subscribe to all of these different paywall journals. And so I found that people were really seeking out those kinds of material, open access materials, um, software, you know, programs and um, languages that use that as well, just all of those different things. And I think that's another really big advantage that those things are already readily embraced. You're not trying to convince anyone, at least in Africa, that um, open access is is needed and necessary because they all see it firsthand. And so that's another big, I think, advantage in addition to all of the many others of thinking outside the box in terms of research questions, thinking about things that apply to the local context, just forming you know, a, fra a cognitive framework that is different than what one might traditionally have in one part of the world. Um, I think that's one of the greatest advantages. So any additional thoughts? No, 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 other than, you know, looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed this panel and I think that uh, we will be also enjoying talking to all of you. Yeah. Uh, during our live uh, question and answer. So don't forget, uh, September 27th, 22nd, uh, 7.30 p.m. Central European time. So please check our program for uh, different time zones also, also not to get, not, not to misunderstood. And uh, we are very much looking forward to meeting you all. And I'm very much looking forward to discussing this further with uh, both Sabina and Dana. Uh, to we hope that uh, actually psychological science uh, will keep improving itself. Thank you, Alma, for having us on board, and uh, we'll see each other soon. See you soon. Thank you.